I think that test-driven development is an important idea. One of the most significant steps forward in software development practice to have happened during my career. And yet, I was peripherally involved in the invention of something called behaviour-driven development. So if I think TDD is so great, why did I feel the need to help with the creation of something else? So which is better, TDD or BDD? And more importantly, what are the differences? And when should you pick BDD or TDD? And I warn you, this is a trick question. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. Uh, if you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus, and Specflow. They're helping us to grow our channel, so please support them in turn by checking out their links in the description below. If you'd like to learn more about continuous delivery, what it really is and how to practice it, check out my training course, Better Software Faster. Again, link in the description below. I have an unusual, perhaps almost unique perspective on behaviour-driven development shared with very few others, because I was there when it was invented. But I wasn't one of the inventors. What is true, though, is that my experiences and those of my teammates informed some of the thinking that led to BDD. What this means is that nearly everyone misses what I and the inventors thought were important ideas at the time. BDD is about behaviour, not about tools and it's much more widely applicable than most teams think. So what do you imagine when you think of BDD? My bet is that you're probably thinking of something rather like this. Something written probably in Gherkin with Cucumber or Specflow. Now please don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with this. But I think that BDD is a bigger idea than that. Let's backtrack a bit though first and get things in order. Test-driven development was named by Kent Beck in the late 1990s and described in his great book Extreme Programming Explained. There were even earlier precedents than that though. Here is part of a discussion taken from the proceedings of the first ever conference on software engineering held in 1968. At that conference Alan Perlis said this, a software system can best be designed if the testing is interlaced with the designing, instead of being used after the design. A simulation which matches the requirements contains the control which organises the design of the system. Through successive repetitions of this process of interlaced testing and design, the model ultimately becomes the software system itself. Despite the somewhat old-fashioned language, that sounds to me a lot like a description of test-driven development in 1968. I was a pretty early adopter of test-driven development, not quite that early. But I later worked for a consultancy called ThoughtWorks. We applied test-driven development to all of our projects at the time. Around this time, there was a lot of debate, a lot of experimentation with automated testing. One of the big debates was test first or test after. Should we write our test before we've written the code that they test or afterwards? We started to notice a pattern in ThoughtWorks. For groups that accepted writing tests after the code was written, there was a common project failure mode. The system would work because the tests made sure of that, but Working on it would gradually become more and more difficult as time progressed, to the point that forward progress pretty much ground to a halt altogether. Let's look at the reasons for that. Let's imagine that we have some code. It already exists, so now we write some tests. Because the code already exists, our code won't be very testable. It wasn't really designed to be. So we add some tests after the code. The trouble is that because our code wasn't designed to be testable, there's stuff that we can't easily get at in that code. 
So getting our code into the state that we would like it to be in, ready for our test, will be tricky. And then asserting that it did what we think it should do will be tricky too. Inevitably, as a result of this, our test will be significantly more tightly coupled to the detail of the implementation than we would like. So if we change our code, our test not only fails, but the test itself is now wrong. We've ended up testing that the code that we wrote was the code that we wrote. This is not very helpful. One of the big benefits touted for test-driven development was that we could change the code and be confident that it would still be working. Writing tests after the code loses or at least weakens this protection. If the tests need to change every time we change the code, they aren't very helpful. At ThoughtWorks, we started changing how we talked about and taught test-driven development. These days, I very strongly emphasize the vital importance of writing the test first. I no longer consider writing unit tests after the code to count as test-driven development. To be test-driven means that the development was driven by tests, so the tests must come first. At ThoughtWorks, we nearly always worked alongside developers from our clients, so part of our job was to help them to adopt this new way of working. We were teaching test-driven development and what we saw was that nearly everyone was making the same mistakes that we had made. Writing the test first is weird, so we'll write them afterwards. I get what these crazy people are talking about. It's all about test coverage. So we'll mandate very high test coverage. So the cycle began again. People concreted their code and tests together and their project started well and then ground to a halt. Meanwhile, people chased test coverage targets and nearly all of the developers gamed the system with tests that fooled the coverage metrics but that didn't actually test anything useful. So inside ThoughtWorks, Dan North and Chris Matz started talking about this and came to the conclusion that test-driven development was fantastic but most teams got it wrong. So how could we do better? How could we help them get to those hot, highlands of success with test-driven development that we were seeing? How could we help people earlier in their adoption of test-driven development see the real massive value that we saw? They came to the conclusion that test-driven development was the right idea, but that we would got the words wrong and the mindset too. It's not about tests, it's about specifications. It's not about testing our code, but rather confirming the behavior of the systems that we create. This was the idea that gave birth to behavior-driven development, how to teach TDD better. These days, I don't think that is what most people see as behavior-driven development, though. Even so, I think that there is still a lot of merit in this idea. BDD is just as applicable at the fine-grained detail level of our code as it is at the high-level requirements end of the process. We'll come back to that idea. But let's take a quick look at where BDD is now. So Chris and Dan started working on getting the words right. They're called test suites specifications and individual tests scenarios. They came up with the idea of given when then, a way to structure scenarios, given some starting conditions, when some action occurs, then we expect some results. Over the years, we, we've learned more. Tools have been created to support this approach, and the most common probably being around the, built around the Gherkin language, implemented in Cucumber and Specflow. These open source tools have done a lot to popularize BDD thinking. But as is inevitably the case, as an idea gains in popularity, some of the nuance gets lost. For me, BDD has never been about the tools. In the early days, I saw it as something of a misstep to try and conflate the problems of natural language processing with a focus on testing the behaviors of our system. Again, Please don't get me wrong, I value the contribution that Cucumber and Specflow have made, but what those tools did was add a little extra complexity 
to allow the specifications and scenarios to be written in something close to natural language. This had the very positive impact of making the specifications readable, even writable, by non-technical people. But that small technical translation overhead meant that this wasn't really ideal or applicable to the fine-grained TDD level testing. So BDD has become almost synonymous these days with functional testing. Specifications written from the perspective of an external user of the system. Now, I reiterate this once again. This is an important, valuable problem to address. But I don't think that it's all that there is to BDD. I call this part of my recommended test strategy acceptance testing, this use of BDD in a functional context. It's definitely BDD, but it's part of a BDD approach, not all of it. If you want to understand more about that stuff, check out some of my other videos on acceptance testing. But for this one, I want to explore that other, less well-known dimension of BDD value. The commonest arguments against test-driven development are that the tests are hard to write, the code is hard to change once the tests are in place, and that TDD tends to lead to poor quality design in code. I confess that I think that these are problems of poor TDD rather than something inherent in TDD itself. I also think that taking a behavioural approach to even these fine grain tests helps with all three of these problems significantly. So let's start with tests being hard to write. Here is a real test from an open source project. Clearly, this was hard to write. But it's also pretty obvious that this test was written after the code, not before. So this is a product of unit testing, but not of TDD. Here's a test from one of my home projects. It's focused on some fairly technical behaviours of the system. In the guts of my system. In this case, generating asynchronous messages from a Java interface. Why doesn't really matter for now. But I did pick these tests because they're far from a user of the system. Nevertheless, I would argue that these tests are focused only on the behaviour of this code, not on its implementation. I can assure you that I wrote these tests before I wrote the code. These are detailed, fine-grained specifications defining the behaviour that I wanted from my code. Not only were these easier to write, but they also helped me to organise my thoughts about what it was that I wanted the code to do. They also encouraged me to explore the design of my code incrementally, growing and evolving its behaviour progressively. I began with the simplest case, made that work, made the test pass, and then built upon it with a slightly more complex case. Now tell me, how does the code that makes this test pass work? I'm sure that you can guess at possible implementations, but this test says nothing about how I chose to do it. It only expresses what the code does, not how it does it. The second problem that people often complain about is that you can't change the code because the tests will break. Let's take another look at the test from that open source project. It calls this function here, get last build. Now, as far as I could see with a quick look at the code, this function is only ever used in this test. That means that this function was added, breaking the encapsulation of the code to allow for this test to run. So this test is coupled to the implementation. It depends on a detailed side effect of how the code works. This test is very fragile. It's easy to imagine ways in which we could change the code that keeps it working, but that causes this test to fail. That's not good. Look again at this test. It's asking for publisher lists, builder lists and logs. It's retrieving items from some presumably transient queue. But can you tell me what it's actually testing? Beyond what the code works in the way in which the code works. Which of these two different styles of testing is more robust in the face of change? 
The last pushback on test-driven development is that it creates poorer designs. I suppose that this depends on what you consider to be good in terms of software design. I believe that high quality code, whatever its nature, has these properties. It works. It's modular, cohesive, has appropriate levels of coupling, generally with a preference towards looser coupling. It has a good separation of concerns, meaning that each part of the code is focused on doing one thing well and that it exhibits information hiding or abstraction so that we can make changes in one part of the code without needing to understand all of the details of other parts of the code. Let's take another quick look at my example. Well, the first of my properties is certainly met. We know that the code works because this test passes. Next, the code is modular. To make my code testable, I've separated my design into a publisher interface, a transport, and a method factory. Again, the details don't matter too much, but this code takes a Java interface as an argument and generates code that you can call through that interface to generate asynchronous messages representing that, message, that method call. One for each method on the interface. This is technical plumbing, but I hope that you will agree that my design is modular. It's broken out into these distinct pieces. It's also cohesive. Everything to do with interpreting an invocation on the interface that we are using as our template for message definitions is implemented in the publisher interface class. Everything to do with sending those messages is in the transport class. Everything to do with translating between the interface and the message that we want to generate is in the publisher method. This design is also pretty loosely coupled. For example, I have three different types of transport that this code runs on top of. But one based on Aeron, one on Kafka, and one on XML over HTTP. I think it's pretty evident that this design also demonstrates a good separation of concerns. Each component of the system is focused on one and only one part of the problem. Finally, this code is also exhibiting good abstraction. I can change the implementation of any of these pieces without changing the code that interacts with them. So, without being too big-headed, I'd say that this was good quality code. I'd also say that these properties of good quality that I value in code got there, at least in part, because I used test-driven development and specifically a BDD flavor of test-driven development to design my code. For me, test-driven development and specifically this BDD-inspired version of it is the best way that I know to get great feedback early in the process of development on the quality of my design. This is the real value that I perceive in TDD and in BDD. And, and approaching all of my testing from a behavioral perspective significantly improves the quality of my testing and so the quality of my code. Thank you very much for watching.